When you're a writer, it often feels like you are all in. You are all in on your story. You're all in on your writing career. You're just all in on everything writer life related. And sometimes I feel that that can lead to a little bit of tunnel vision. And that's never really a great thing. So in today's episode of the How to Be an Author podcast, I thought it would be a great idea to discuss something um, about subplots. And I'm going to thematically link this to the ideas of compartmentalizing and enriching your life with things other than writing, why you might want to do that. I'm going to be talking about side gigs for writers in addition to, you know, writing fiction. And of course, we're going to be talking about the craft of writing, essentially writing subplots into your novel. Because here's the thing, you might have the most spectacular plot ever, but sometimes it's a really great idea to deviate from that a tiny bit and write a great subplot. The issue is, though, I've seen so many writers try to do this, and it's not easy. It, you know, when you learn the art of storytelling, I feel like that's kind of universal. That's something that we're almost born knowing how to do. We know that we need a main character. We need, you know, a problem that they start off with. We need this journey and a resolution. But when you're dealing with a subplot and you have to have that running alongside the main plot of your story, um, it gets kind of complex. And if you listen to my podcast episode about keeping things simple, you're probably going like, wait a second. Uh, writing coach, you told me to keep it simple. Yes, let's talk about how to add a subplot in ways that are a little bit more simple and that don't ruin your main plot. I think that's really important. The same thing goes for our mindset when we're adding more layers to our life. I want this to enrich your writer life, not take away from it necessarily. Many of you are afraid that if you're not all in 100%, you're going to be losing something of that intensity that feeds so many writers. And I think that that couldn't be further from the truth. And also when it comes to business, many of you think that getting a side gig is something of a cop-out, and I'm here to tell you that it's not. Because the financial realities of making money as a writer can be kind of tough. And we're going to talk not only about side gigs for you, but also what it takes to make a living as an author. It's not easy. It's not just luck, though. And there are lots of different moving pieces. And the problem is, it takes a long time. It takes a lot of effort. And a side gig might be essential for you if you're not in a position to be financially independent or supported by somebody else. So let's dive right into this really interesting subplot episode. I don't want to beat around the bush and get lost on the way. I'm really looking forward to talking about this with you because as a writing coach, I've seen so many writing clients struggling with these very issues. And so let's get started. If you're a writer dreaming of becoming a successful author, join me, writing coach Karenna Akavane, on the How to Be an Author podcast, your weekly source for writing information, inspiration, and motivation. Hello, welcome to the How to Be an Author podcast with me, your writing coach, Karenna Akavane. It is my passion in life to not only write books, but also to help authors like you go from idea to published and everything in between. I am here to fix those problems that come up along the way and that block you, that cause resistance, that cause writer's block, that cause you to stop working towards your dream of being a published successful author. And I've helped so many writers Even those who thought they were irretrievably stuck, I have helped them to go on to publish not just one, but several books. So I know that this is always possible, but sometimes it's a little bit of a puzzle. And sometimes, you know, you've got to look at what's not working. And many times, if we're going to be talking about subplots, I want to talk about the craft of writing first. Many authors struggle with the idea of a subplot. Many of the books that you read have a subplot and you really enjoy it. So you're like, oh, I definitely want a B story in my book. And also if you've read, uh, you know, Save the Cat, they also have that B story that they talk about Um, because it does. Why is a subplot a good idea? What are the advantages of having a subplot versus a book without a subplot? Well, a subplot adds complexity and depth to your overall story. 
It kind of makes it a little bit more intricate and engaging by introducing additional characters, conflicts, and events. Now, this is fun to the reader, but remember, it kind of needs to work within your story, right? You're trying to add complexity and depth to the overall story. So remember, too many of you have these subplots that don't really tie in very much, or they tie in just because one of the characters in the story is going through it. It's like, no, this is two different stories. You can't do that, right? Another thing that a subplot can do is it is fun for the writer. It offers opportunities for character development beyond just the main characters, right? Supporting characters can have their own arcs. They have their own challenges within the subplot, and it allows the reader to connect with and understand them on a deeper level, like a character who is just a sidekick to the main character in general can then kind of have their own subplot. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I now see um, more of the stakes here and I understand more who this character is, right? But again, it needs to feed into the story, right? A well-executed subplot is really there to control the pacing of the story a little bit. So some writers are like, oh yeah, cool. The subplot's there to provide a break from the main plot. Like it's going to prevent monotony. Honey, if you've got too much monotony though in your book, um, be a little bit careful because you're not going to fix it with just a subplot, right? But definitely it is something that can create, I think of it more as building tension and suspense, right? You're alternating between different storylines. And this is really important. We're going to be talking a little bit more about this when I talk about the craft of writing a great subplot is that it's really crucial how you organize your subplot. It's crucial to look at where these moments in the story where you have the subplot narrative happening where they are. Because when you're alternating between different storylines, it's essential to do it in a way that builds the tension and suspense, not in a way that is frustrating or boring, right? So that's really, really crucial. Um, Also, when it comes to subplots, they can be kind of driving home the theme of the story. And this is where you use the subplot to explore the same main theme of your story in a different way from different ideas and perspectives. Now, I did this in one of the romance novels that I recently wrote, where there's kind of a parallel subplot of another relationship that kind of ended like my main character's relationship. And by fixing that, they're hoping that they can fix their own relationship, right? So this is enriching this thematic content, the theme being that you know, misunderstandings can ruin a potentially really awesome relationship. So that's something that you can do and it really works well. Another thing you can do in a subplot, and this gets really hard, but you can kind of have these symbolic elements that you can use for foreshadowing. So the subplot's adding layers of meaning to the story. And what's fun is when the reader's trying to decipher what the connection is. Because here's the thing, if there's no real connection, again, you're robbing your reader of a really fun part of the reading process. They love to be kind of looking at, you know, solving something. So they're looking at connections and they're puzzling over things. That's really, really cool. A subplot is really over reader engagement because readers are the ones who are going to be drawn to certain characters and storylines. It's about balancing, it's about creating tension, it's about playing with your reader to help the overall book. You're really trying to create the most well-rounded and satisfying reading experience that you can. And remember, when you have a subplot, you really can use it to tie up loose ends or resolve an unresolved issue. Because We've had episodes on a satisfying ending for your book, and sometimes some endings feel like they came out of nowhere, and it's like, wait, this is wrapping up a little bit too neatly or whatever. This is where a subplot can be really useful because your subplot's been contributing to the resolution of this story all along, and only at the end does your reader realize that, oh, wow, okay, this is so cool. These two things were connected. That's really important. Another thing that subplots can do is they contribute to world building. They show a different facet of the setting. Um, And also, for those of you writing series, you're going to love this. Um, In many cases, a subplot can be the foundation for a future installment in the series. 
That's kind of fun because you always want to 100% resolve your main issue, but in your subplot, you can have a little mini cliffhanger. That's kind of okay. And then carry it on into a subsequent book if that's what you want to do. So remember, when you're thinking of writing a subplot, remember that your subplot is there to enhance the overall quality of the book. It's there to support your main plot. It's there to create a more satisfying reading experience for your audience. If it doesn't do that, then you don't have the right subplot and it's back to the drawing board. Now, let's talk about how we are going to seamlessly integrate this B story or this side plot into your main plot. We don't want to overshadow the primary narrative. That's where it becomes a real mistake. Like when you don't know what's the subplot, what's the main plot, that can be problematic, right? So the first thing I want you to do is that when you've thought of your subplot, I really want you to define its purpose. What is the main purpose of your subplot? Is it to add complexity to a character? Is it to introduce a theme? Is it to add context? Like, what is it? Or is it something crucial that is going to kind of get unwrapped at the end? You need to know this from the get-go as you start to write and integrate your subplot into your story. Now, remember go back and look at, okay, we've defined the purpose. Is the purpose strong enough? What is the relevance of my subplot? Like, is it connected thematically and emotionally to the main plot? Is it enhancing my narrative or is it distracting from it? Because again, if it's not enhancing your narrative, you need to go back to the drawing board, right? In the subplot as well, think about who are my characters going to be? This is crucial, right? Are they new characters Or are they ones that are existing in the main story? Ensure that they have their own goals, their own conflicts, their own character arcs. They have to be distinct from the main characters in your story. So you can't really have a subplot where your main character is doing like a B story side quest. That tells the reader that, oh, okay, the main plot isn't important right? So you definitely cannot have that. You can't have your main character being a hugely involved person in the subplot unless they're involved in it thinking that it's something else that's tied to their main quest and they end up being wrong. And that is a whole other thing, right? So you've got so many different ways of writing this subplot in ways that touch the main character, but has to be distinct from the main character. And remember, there needs to be a clear arc. I often tell my writers that, you know, your character, your sub, uh, your subplot, your side story needs to have a clear beginning, middle, and end, right? A subplot has its own story arc. It has its own conflicts and resolutions. So I really recommend to my writers that they write it completely independently first. This is so much easier than writing chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Oh, let me jump into B story and let me write a couple scenes of that. And then let me jump back into my other one. You're not getting a clear arc this way. You might be getting a little bit choppy and you might be getting confused. So I usually say this is a huge writing hack. Write the entire story, each arc, your main story, your main plot, and the subplot. Write them separately. And then you're able to weave it in, introducing it at strategic points. You don't want to have abrupt transitions. You want to allow the subplot to flow naturally. And remember that the intensity of the subplot should also ebb and flow. It should mirror the pacing of the main plot. And this really helps to maintain the balance because you do not want your subplot to overshadow the primary storyline Unless you're doing this kind of stylistic exercise and you're playing with it, that's fine. But know that you might kind of disappoint some readers. Now, when you're integrating this subplot into your story, you want to find these points. I mentioned this at the beginning. You want to find these points where the subplot intersects with the main plot. And this could be through shared characters, themes, events, So think about how can I tie it in so that I'm not just jumping from one to the other without a reason to do so. So for example, I've done things um, with writers where they'll be describing a scene 
and the character touches a glass, for example, and boom, the glass is that thematic element that we jump into the subplot and you've got other characters touching a glass, for example. That's a really silly example, but it kind of works, right? Or you've got the character um, attending a dance and all of a sudden uh, we've got you know our subplot where there's a dance involved. And remember that subplots can be at a different time. They can be at the same time. They can be in a different geography. Like think about how this subplot is different, but how it's related as well, right? There really is so much importance to finding those intersection points. It's crucial. Having that cohesion between your subplot and your main plot is really, really important. And then be mindful. Think about, okay, how much time and space does my subplot occupy in my story? It should be significant enough to matter, but it shouldn't dominate the narrative at the expense of the main plot. Now, sometimes you have a narrative that has dual plots that go back and forth. Usually I find that it's easier if you've got one primary plot and one secondary, but I would say that you can go up to 50-50, but just be really careful that your balance doesn't get thrown off. And I would say you also want to think about in your subplot, is it consistent in tone, style, and voice, or is it different? You want a cohesive reading experience, but you also want the reader to understand, you know, this is subplot, this is main plot. How do you indicate that to them? That's really important. Like I say sometimes, you know, some writers will use dates at the top of their chapters. Some writers will put subplot in italics. I warn against putting too many italics in, you know, long pages of italics are hard to read, but you can put the name of a different character. You can, you know, write it as uh, just kind of an introductory paragraph or sentence, like meanwhile, back in, you know, the Highlands or whatever. You can write that sort of thing where you have an indication to your reader right away that we've jumped away from the main story and we're back in the subplot now. And then also, again, an indication of when you're jumping back into the main story. You never want your reader to be reading a page or two and then all of a sudden being like, oh, wait, this isn't what I thought. This is the subplot. And then they have to go back and read and be like, OK, I totally misunderstood that. So that's really major because really how effective your subplot is depends on how your reader is experiencing it. That's crucial. So this is why I always say this, ask beta readers for feedback. Once you've written your subplot, get feedback. Beta readers can give you these great insights on whether the subplot enhances or detracts from the story, whether they're confused, whether they can tell what was subplot, what wasn't, you know, all of that. So you definitely want to ask those readers because so many times, again, we always connect the dots in our head when we're writing. We skip over the fact that it's not really understandable because we connected the dots, but your reader can't. So remember that the beta readers are a huge part of the equation when it comes to writing this properly. Now, now that we've talked about the craft of writing a great subplot, let's talk about the subplots in our life. Let's talk about how to have something in our writing life other than just writing. So many of us have been told this lie, and I really detest this, when you're told that writers write, writers write every day, this destructive ideal of the writer being completely immersed in their writing, completely devoured by their writing. It's like you're in The Shining, right? And that's all you're doing is doing this writing and you're doing nothing else and you've abandoned all your friends and your family and you're halfway burnt out and that's the glamour of it. But I don't think so. I think that it's really important to compartmentalize your writing life a little bit because you need balance. It can't be all consuming. It's crucial. It can, it's, why is it? Why do I think it's so crucial? Because I know that some of you are probably listening to me right now and rolling your eyes. You're like, hey, um, here I am writing my book all the time. And right now I'm listening to a writing podcast and I'm obsessed with writing. Okay, that's great. A, a little bit of obsession is important. If you weren't obsessed, you would never be successful. I know that. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit more in the uh, extra side gig section of this podcast. But though it's really important to be super focused on your career as a writer, there are some key reasons why balance is so important. Number one, you cannot burn out. Burnout is a thing. It exists. And writing, like any creative endeavor, it can be mentally and emotionally taxing. 
Without balance, you really do risk burning out. And burning out is going to wreck your creativity. It's going to wreck your motivation. And whenever you burn out, it takes you a really long time to crawl out of that hole, right? Your mental and your emotional health are so important. And when you're spending excessive time on writing without breaks, it really does hurt your mental and emotional health. You need to take care of yourself. You need to reduce that stress stress and anxiety that's associated with this creative pursuit of yours. Creativity and creation of a book should be happy. And I know that there are times when it's frustrating. I've been going through some of these really dark moments of like, oh my God, I'm never going to break through and make as much money as I want to make from my writing. Or, oh my God, why did I only sell this many copies of my book today? Like we all kind of hit those moments that are really stressful and yucky, but the balance really helps to see those and put them in perspective. Honestly, you think that diving into your book a thousand percent is what's going to make it good, but in fact, having these experiences and stimuli outside of your writing life can actually enhance your creativity. Doing different things, reading things, interacting with people, all of these things provide new perspectives and ideas for your writing. And this is something I'm going to touch on in the whole side gig section that you're probably already dreading listening to, but you need to listen to. But I think that creativity is enhanced by doing something else. And spending all your time writing, you might think that that's what leads to productivity. You might think that that's what it takes, but honestly, let me tell you, and this is something that it's so hard to see it objectively, and I've also been victim to this where I think, oh my God, if I spend all my time doing this, I'm going to do more. No. As fatigue sets in, you get diminishing returns. You are not being as productive as you think. When you balance your writing with other activities, it helps to maintain your focus and productivity. When you do sit down to write, you're approaching your work with a refreshed mind and with more energy, and you're probably actually doing better work. Also, this whole thing of being stuck in front of your computer all day long, you end up neglecting personal relationships And it really strains your connections with your friends, your family, your colleagues. You need a support system as a human being. It's really important. And when you're writing about relationships between characters, but ignoring your own relationships, that's not a great thing. And I know what it can be like to get this tunnel vision and be like, well, I'll I'll go do that stuff and I'll make plans with my friends when I'm done writing this. You're never really done writing it because then there's the next book and the next book and the next book. So strained connections with friends, family, and colleagues is going to contribute to burnout and is going to leave you alone when you need their help. And nobody's ever gone it alone. I know that writing feels like a really solitary thing, and you might want to listen to my podcast about solitude and writing. I think it's really important to put it in perspective. And also just to be, you know, at the base level you need those friends to buy your books. You need those friends to, you know, talk up your work. And so being with them and doing other things is going to be really great. And engaging in various activities and pursuits can also broaden your skills. This brings all these new ideas to your writing, but also it keeps you sharp so that if you want to do some other job at the same time, you can do that. Because if not, you're just sitting there in your ivory tower And you're not being exposed to anything new. You really do want to be a citizen of the world as you write because it's too easy to end up with blinders on. And then you don't even know what's going on in the world. You don't know what's going on in, you know, current events. You don't know what's going on in the writing industry and you end up having poorer writing for it. And also, hey, physical health is kind of important. Physical activity, exercise, writing is sedentary. And you don't want to have that butt cheek spread that happens when you are just writing all the time. It's not great. Like I want you to be able to write for a long time and that takes some absolute balance in your life. So you definitely want to be maintaining that well-being and writing, it takes a holistic approach, right? To both your personal and your professional life. You need to grow as a writer as the whole person, not just as this little, pale, frustrated person behind their computer. So how do you do this? How do you create that balance? How do you diversify your life? So I think that having a schedule is great, and so many authors are resistant to the schedule. 
But I think that if you have a schedule that's not necessarily every day, but that is, you know, pretty consistent so that you feel like you're getting a lot of your writing done, but that it also allows for other things, I think that's really important. And many writers, I tell them that they should actually use their timers and alarms because too many of us get sucked into the writing. We're like, oh, I'll just write this scene. I'll just write this chapter. And then you look up and it's midnight. And you didn't go see your friend and you didn't eat and you didn't take care of yourself. And now you're tired and you're going to have, you know, the next day's ruined. So timers and alarms can really help. Also, you know what? Prioritize your other responsibilities as well. I know you're writing a book, but it's not fair to your family or to yourself to say, oh yeah, I can't do the dishes because I'm writing my book. Oh yeah, I can't take my kid to school because I'm writing my book. Oh, I can't do this family dinner because I'm writing a book. No. No. You really do need to have your life and then your writing life. And I know that that feels like the opposite of everything you've ever heard, but it's very true. Be mindful of what's going on, right? And you know, many writers are like, oh yeah, wait, but I don't have time to do that. There's so many things it takes. Guess what? Limit your social media. Limit the useless distractions, right? Turn off that social media, turn off the phone, create this environment that maximizes productivity, and then you're able to be free for other things that matter. Communication with others is really important. Be like, hey, my phone's going to be off from this time to that time because I'm writing, but then I'd love to see you. That's really important, right? You don't want to have the burnout and you don't want to have your friends being mad at you, and you want to be balanced. It is so important because It's going to help you to have this writing career of yours last a long time without destroying your life. And I'm not being dramatic here. I think it absolutely can happen and you don't want it to happen. So speaking of balanced life and your writing career and all of this stuff, this is the part that nobody really likes to talk about. But um, being an author, you kind of need to think about how am I going to support myself? Because yes, I know the dream is to be a full-time best-selling author. We all want that. But here's the thing. Do you know what that takes? You've seen the couple examples where somebody was picked up by a publisher and the publisher, you know, promoted their book like crazy and they're a bestseller and, you know, this is what they're doing. But you see one, two, three, four of those. But compared to all the working writers out there, And then you've got some writers who are making a living, but they're not making a massive living. And do you know what it took for them to get to that point? It probably took them writing at least five, six, seven books minimum. So you've got to do something to support yourself until you get to that point where you've got the critical mass of all the books. And knowing that when you're writing your books, you also need to be promoting your books. You need to know about marketing. You need to know about all this other stuff. I think it's important to keep yourself in the real world of, you know, having something that can sustain you financially as you write your book. Because writing a book, even let's say that you have one book that sells really briskly, the next one might not. Either plenty of writers, if you look up on TikTok, plenty plenty of working writers who will tell you very honestly that, yeah, they were making a full-time income One year and then the next year, their next book kind of flopped. So it's not stable. Think of it like being an actor, right? You're going to have one project and then no projects for the next three years. What then, right? So having a consistent sort of of income, that financial stability can afford you a lot more of that peace of mind so that you can keep writing without being too worried. And also when you're thinking, so many writers come to me, they're like, I need to write a book because I need to make some money fast. Honey, Writing a book is the slowest way of making money, right? So you want to be realistic about how long it takes to be successful and, you know, the odds of being that successful. Really be cautious that you're not going to write yourself into the poorhouse. So the financial stability, important. And if you have a partner, you might want to talk honestly with your partner about, you know, what can I do to contribute to the household or are you going to cover me while I write these things? And at what point are we going to decide that it's not financially viable or that it is, right? That's really an important conversation to have. 
But I think that engaging in a side career is really great because it gives you these networking opportunities. It gives you an understanding of the real world. It gives you ideas even for your stories. But many writers find that it's great to engage in a writing related career as an author. And I think this is a great idea. This is what I did when I became a writing coach and when I was editing stuff and I was writing magazine articles, because I think that when you're engaging in a writing related career, you're diversifying your skills within what you're doing. You're writing for different purposes, different audiences, in different mediums. And I think this really improves your overall ability to communicate, to write. You become versatile, you become adaptable. You learn how to write on a deadline. You learn how to write for others. I think that's really cool. Also, when you're kind of in a writing-related field, you can have more opportunities to network with other professionals. So this can give you more exposure, more insights, more resources, and more of an understanding of how the world works. So let's say that you're working in a publishing house or a literary agency. Did you know that there are a ton of people who work in literary agencies who are published authors as well? This experience is so invaluable to them when they're navigating the process of publishing their book. And the connections they have are probably going to help to get them published as well. Also, when you are in the writing career world or when you're in the professional world, especially if you're doing, let's say you're doing content creation or blogging or whatever, this really helps you to see how to build a platform. Because so many authors who are not working in a writing related career, they fantasize that they're just going to write the book and people are going to buy it. When you're working in a writing relating field, you start to see how important it is to build a platform and what it takes. How do you build a following? How do you establish yourself as an expert or an authority in your niche? It's not easy, right? It takes time. It takes work. It takes, you know, pushing things through. It takes time management skills and discipline. When you learn these things, I think that you can transfer these skills to your writing as well. I think that's such a gift that you can do. Also, when you're working, you'll get feedback. You'll get critique from your bosses, from your colleagues. This is just the everyday experience of working, right? This experience can really help you to develop a thicker skin when you get criticism on your writing. It can help you to improve your writing skills because you're being more objective. You're realizing that feedback and critique actually help, right? I think that that's really great. And I think it's so important to have this professional development ongoing because staying updated on these industry trends, learning new techniques, having additional skills, this can help you both in your writing and in your survival. I know that it kind of sucks to think about a fallback option. There's so many people out there who are like, no, I'm desperate. I'm just going to make this work. I don't have a fallback option. They glorify that. But you know what? A fallback option is great. You do not want to starve to death. It's not a pretty scene. So think about what you can do to support yourself that's going to be satisfying, that's going to help you as well in your writing career. You don't want your gig that you're going to do to not align with your skills and interests or with your writing. But sometimes I think, I mean, hell, I would say being, you know, an Uber driver, okay, that's cool. You can work it around your writing career. You meet lots of people, all this stuff. That's great. But maybe having a gig within the writing industry is more enriching. So think about things like freelance writing, right? You're writing articles, blog posts, copy for clients. You know, a lot of websites and businesses are looking for quality content. And this is definitely something that you can set yourself up to do pretty quickly, knowing that you're going to have to keep looking for those jobs because you're a freelancer, right? So that might feel like a lot because being an author is essentially like being a freelancer, right? You're going after things all the time. So you might not want to do that. So maybe you want to be doing content editing or proofreading, like for a publisher or for a company, a business. This can be a great way to have a pretty stable means of making income, and it really helps you to improve your own written material. You start looking for mistakes and stuff like that. Copywriting is another thing. This is so great because when you're writing website content, product descriptions, promotional materials, you're really learning how to build your own author uh, platform as well. It really, really helps. Another thing you can do is write resumes helping clients to highlight their skills and experiences, helping them to stand out in the job market, it helps you as well when you're crafting your bio as an author. You can write grants. 
This is great. Securing funding for nonprofits or organizations. That's kind of a cool thing that you can do. It's not rocket science and it, you know, it brings in the money. So that's pretty cool. You can do that for sure. You can also do ghostwriting. Now I have a few clients who were ghostwriters and they've been writing for, you know, other clients who don't have the time or the expertise to write something. Um, your name doesn't appear on the work. You get paid for your writing. And I think this is cool, but I know a lot of authors who end up burning out because they're writing so much. And then when it comes time to write their own thing, it kind of bleeds into it or it burns them out. So that's not super cool. Uh, online courses are something that can kind of work a little bit. I've got a few online courses up myself. Um, for example, from idea to published in six months is an awesome online course that I've built. And I built my DIY author workbook, which can really, really help you along the way. And if you're curious in how to do an online course, I also have a course on creating online courses as an author. Now, you need to keep in mind that selling the course is not always easy, right? But if you're on a platform like Udemy or Teachable or something like that, you can reach a bigger audience. And I have a course on Udemy as well, which is all about being on you know, video as a writer. Um, I think that's really interesting, but you need to realize that this is going to take a lot of skills and a lot of time. It's not a guaranteed income for sure, but it can definitely be something pretty interesting. Other things are technical writing, kind of boring, but whatever. Um, affiliate marketing you can do. I kind of feel though like this is a full job. My daughter was telling me like, oh my God, you should do the affiliate marketing. I don't know. I think about this and I think like a lot of people do this and they do a great job with it. I feel like it dilutes my brand maybe and it's a whole separate job, but definitely something to think about, right? You can also do, if you've been doing your own social media really well, you can do social media management for people. That's a really great way of having quite a few clients and you don't have to do too much work. You're batching the work and you're getting it done and you're being more objective. So you can create their identity, their personal brand, all that stuff. That really works quite well as well. Um, what else can you do? You can do marketing. You can help somebody with marketing. You can do speech writing. Uh, you can help people to produce podcasts like this one. Yay. Um, or you can help people to write uh, newsletters. There are a lot of companies that are helping authors even write their newsletter, though I kind of warn you against this because I think that for you, having a newsletter is a huge part of your platform. Many of you receive my newsletter every week, and you see that I put a lot of time and effort into crafting that newsletter. And I think that your audience is looking to hear your own voice in that, but other people don't do that. Other businesses don't do that. So you can help them to write a really great newsletter and you can get paid for it. So remember, the key is to find a side gig that aligns with your skills, your interests, and your availability. I want you to combine different side gigs if you want to, to diversify your income streams so that if one thing falls through, you've got all the other ones. But also I want it to contribute to your writing career. It's kind of like a subplot, right? It needs to feed the main plot. The minute you fall out of balance, you've lost the plot. So I'm curious if you want to talk to me about what you're thinking about doing as a side gig, as a writer, or if you found this really good hustle that you do that fits in with your writing really well, I would love to talk with you about it. I'm always learning and, and applying these things to my other clients as well. And remember, if you want to write your book and publish your book and have a writer platform in as little time as possible, my course is going to be so super valuable for you from Idea to Published in six months or DIY author or any of my other courses that I have, if you're still working on your mindset from aspiring writer to successful author can be the kick in the pants that you needed mindset wise to really get you going. That's it. Thank you so much for being here on the How to Be an Author podcast. I look so forward to being with you next time as we talk about more parts of the writer's life, your writing craft, your writing mindset, and the business of being an author. If you have any pressing writing related questions or would like to be featured on the How to Be an Author podcast, please feel free to reach out on my website, creativeandwritingcoach.com.